I'm so glad to be able to join with you uh, in S Singapore and those people that are watching from around the world. Uh, this is the Women of Hope Conference for Christian Women and Leaders. And this is really a time that God is raising up a new generation of women in leadership. And I'm so thankful to talk about and share that world-shaking report with you. And uh, in fact, I wrote a book called Women Rise Up that is just for you. If you haven't read it yet, women from all over the world are reading and applying it, how God can change your life. And you know, I have known Pastor Callie Lou for some time. She's under our covering for the generals. And you know, she is an innovator. She is one that not only is called the women, but she is raising up prayer houses. I was looking, the name of the ministry is actually the Worldwide Glory Network Alliance. And boy, that is an appropriate name, I'll have to say that. You know, there's now you know some of you that are involved, some of you may not uh, know very much about the network, but there are houses of prayer that she's raised up in many, many nations of the world. It's very exciting to see that how this network is planting houses of prayer like some people would plant a church network. And they're doing such a great job. Maybe you're part of it. I want to commend you for doing that and, and for being part of this network that Pastor Kelly has put together. It's just amazing what God is doing. And it's always a privilege to talk to women. You know, as I travel around the world, I'm seeing such just outstanding women leadership um, from Hong Kong to Singapore, many Asian nations, the Pacific Rim nations as well, African nations. In fact, as I'm talking to you, I'm just getting pictures of women that I know across the globe that are really bringing reformation, bringing change, and, you know, we need a reformation, don't we? We want to transform our nations, but we want to be reformers to change them. I think God is really marrying this concept of revival and reformation. Many of us have prayed for revival for many years, but now God is saying we need to arise as reformers. And so I want to share a message with you just a few minutes today as I was, you know, meditating on what I should share, I want to talk to you about God's beautiful women. You are one of God's beautiful women. So I just want to start out this teaching by saying, hello, beautiful. Hello, beautiful. Hello, beautiful ones. I even have a wonderful scripture for this. It's um, Ecclesiastes 311. He has made everything beautiful in his time. And I could even say everyone and put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. There's something about being in God that makes one beautiful. I don't know if you've seen people or had friends that, you know, you just look at them and you're thinking, wow, you are becoming more beautiful every year. You know, sometimes we think that... Um, um, aging should make us less beautiful but I find when the presence of God is upon us it makes us a lot more beautiful why there's that radiance that comes from in our heart there's that radiance that comes from within our soul I don't know if you've ever noticed a, a saint of God a woman who has prayed for many years and and maybe a grandmother or a great-grandmother, but when you look at them, it's just like glory is pouring out of them. There's such a sweetness to their countenance. You just love being around them. You just feel the presence of God around them. And so, beautiful women, that's what we want to be. That's what we want to become. And we want to encourage others. You know, it never hurts to say a kind word. Now, I know this is very simple, and you say, well, what's the revelation in that? Well, have you noticed when someone lives in an atmosphere of kindness instead of an atmosphere where people are very critical, the change that happens in people? And so, you know, I want us to all enter in today. Okay, can we? God wants us to have hope. You know, many people are downcast in the scripture. Why so downcast? Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. A lot of us are going through challenging moments. Last night, something happened to me. 
And just for a little while, it felt like darkness was trying to grip my heart. But I began to worship and I began to pray. And this morning, it's just gone. You know, whatever it was that was trying to oppress me, I recognized it as something external. I got some news and it seemed like, you know, it was not good news and it was very concerning to me. But then I realized, wait a minute, Satan is trying to do something to my soul in the midst of all of this. So what is it? Satan gets two for one. The person I'm concerned about, the person I'm praying for, and then me too. No, 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 that's not the way it should be. We should tell our soul to rise up. We should tell our soul, look, my emotions are not going to rule me, but God is ruling me right now. Might not happen in one minute. Your emotion will turn or two emotions will change or two or three. But I guarantee if you keep worshiping, worshiping and you stand on the word of God, it will change. Right now we have choices, don't we? We have a choice whether we will become more beautiful in time or more bitter. Whether we will walk around with bitterness, our countenance. You know, I've seen some very, very beautiful women, but they are not beautiful. There's a hardness about them. There's just something that that is critical about them, something that or feels needy, or maybe they feel an orphan spirit. But God wants you to get rid of that. You know, God wants you to realize that you're called to go from glory to glory. You're not called to go backwards. You're not called to, to regress. You're called to progress and to progress. And God wants that to happen for you. Take Sarah in the Bible. Most of us who are Christians, we know the story of Sarah, how she became so beautiful that a king desired her. And I believe that's for us too. Well, you know, you say, well, you know, the older I get, the things that were north are going south. Well, that may be true, but I believe there can be something that emanates from you, something of the presence of God, something of the glory of God. That, you, that people will look at you and say, hmm, are you doing your hair differently? Or, or what is it about you? No, it's God's glory. When you spend time in prayer and you spend time with God, the hopelessness will leave you and hope will come into your heart. Uh, you know, and I wrote about this, you know, uh, in fact, I was looking at this, that I had written a story about myself and the story is about making choices. When I was 20 years old, I was at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, I was a junior, uh, third year at university, studying music, I'm a musician. And I, I suddenly found myself getting depressed. I didn't know why I was depressed, but it's like I would wake up in the morning, it just seems like there was a dark cloud over me. One of those dark clouds I couldn't push away. It's kind of like I fell emotionally in a black hole somewhere. And yes, there was a trigger to it, but I was going down and down and down. And I, I remember I quit university. I went home. I left Arizona where I was going to school at Grand Canyon. And I went back to San Antonio, Texas, where uh, my family was. And the doctors didn't know what to do with me. Um, some, one doctor thought I had epilepsy because I was shaking so hard. Another doctor, um, uh, thought I, um, couldn't eat, you know, so maybe I was, I had a condition where I wasn't able to eat. I couldn't cry. I just became very, very locked up in my soul. And, uh, you know, I just stopped believing in myself. I stopped believing in others and, I did not believe this Bible verse, evidently. And I love this Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. I was emotionally stuck. I was spiritually stuck. I wasn't sure about my relation with the Lord. And, you know, but one day at, when I was home in San Antonio, Texas, and I left school, left a full scholarship, full music scholarship to university. All of a sudden, as I was praying, the Lord said to me, and I heard it so clearly, clearly in a voice that seemed audible, Cindy, get up and go back to school. I was like, wow. I mean, how was I going to do that? 
I think I had some condition kind of el like elderly people get called sundowners when it started to get nighttime I would get very fearful and um, you know I would my body would shake and I was in such a a mess I was just a mess and but the Lord said to me Cindy get up and go back to school and the doctors had given me antidepressants I think I was taking up to eight antidepressants a day now I'm not recommending you go off if you're an antidepressant go off like I did but I went and I flushed all those pills down the toilet because the Lord had told me get up and go back to school so I uh, it, it just happened to be that you know I I I could I, I needed to go back for a little while so I went I found a place to live and I got a job now this was a miracle because I hadn't I wasn't even really hardly functional and I started working and every day it was hard every day it was hard to get up but I read a story by a woman named Catherine Marshall and this story was how what had happened to me it happened to Catherine Marshall and she found out that she had not only unforgiveness against her, but she has something the Bible calls the oughts against any, meaning you have something against someone else and you, you're you holding on to that. And actually what you do is you put yourself in a prison, prison emotionally when you do that. And I put other people in a prison too. And by my unforgiveness, I wasn't aware I had unforgiveness. And I just began to ask the Lord, you know, how heal me, Lord? How do I get out of this? And so this all was taking place before the Lord said to me, get up and go back to university. And so um, I made a list of people I needed to release. And so not only did I forgive them, I released them from my judgment. I released them from having to be whoever I wanted them to be. And so I began to do this systematically. And then... I had a revelation. I wasn't called to live in the emotional realm. I was called to live by the Word of God. The Word of God said that God had plans for me. The Word of God said that God had good things for me. And so what had happened to me, what had happened to me is I became shipwrecked. And the Bible actually talks about being shipwrecked in 1 Timothy 1, 19. And this is really powerful. And second, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 1.19 talks about how uh, Satan can shipwreck us and how Satan can actually, uh, has shipwrecked these two men, Hymenius and Alexander, and shipwrecked them so they became shipwrecked in the faith. So what Satan wants to do is shipwreck you. He wants to cause you not to have a destiny, not to have a way forward. He wants to tell you, you're always going to be emotionally a mess. He wants to tell you, there is no future for you. Many of these things even lead people to want to commit suicide. Maybe you failed in your grades at school. Maybe you, you feel humiliated. Maybe you got humiliated by a former boyfriend or a husband or an ex-husband or a church. Whatever it is, Satan wants to put you in an emotional state that you feel captive and you can't get out of. So how do you tell people are, are shipwrecked sometimes? Well, if you look at a woman and she never changes the way she looks, you know, she's just always looking, you know, one way. Maybe she looks the same way as when she was in high school or the best time of her life, but she just doesn't advance in how she looks. Or, or um, you know, or even emotionally, you know, maybe she's an adult, but she's acting like a teenager. Well, this is an evidence of being shipwrecked. I was shipwrecked in my emotions. I was having panic attacks. I couldn't eat. That's why they thought maybe I had epilepsy. I was shaking so much. And so, uh, but I began to forgive. One thing the Lord had me forgive was people who had hurt my family. My dad was a pastor. And um, uh, there were so many bad things that had happened to my family in church. I remember one story, Daddy was a Baptist pastor, and in those days in the Baptist church, I don't know if it still is now, but you would vote on the pastor's salary in a business meeting every year. And so one business meeting, I'll never forget it, I was about 16 years old, um, they were talking about Daddy and how much they should pay him. And they were talking about whether they should give him a $5 a month raise. 
Well, at that time, we had to pray to eat. We never knew if we were going to have enough money for food. And so these were people, some of them wealthy, some of them doing well, not having to pray for food, not having, they were not so fan, financially strapped. And in those days, they also believed in keeping a pastor poor and humble. They thought if he was poor, he would be more humble, which is ridiculous, of course. You know, that's, the Bible says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. In other words, a workman is worthy of his hire. So anyway, I remember sitting in the back of the church and I was listening to people fight whether they should give daddy a $5 a month raise. And I'm thinking about the times when we were struggling for money or our car would break down or something terrible would happen. And I just, I got mad. And the more I listened to this congregational meeting over daddy's salary, the madder I got. So after the service, I was near my mama and my mom was just a woman of grace. She, she was so gracious. And uh, there was this lady, I'm going to tell you a name, it wasn't her real name, Mrs. Leatherberry. She came up to my mother and she started criticizing my daddy. She says, well, if your husband would visit people in the hospital more, this church would grow. Or, you know, he's not spending enough time um, um, just in general visitation. Or, I don't know, it was one thing after the other. Criticizing my dad criticizing my mom and you have to see this was right on top of this horrible congregational meeting and uh, you know I, I remember standing behind my mom and my mom just kind of making sure that I was behind her and uh, Mrs. Leatherberry criticizing criticizing and mom just listened and finally she smiled so sweetly and she said oh Mrs. Leatherberry I'm so sorry you feel that way because we love you so much wow a soft answer asked, you know, a soft answer puts away wrath. And I, you know, for me, I was such a, we call it here in the U.S., I don't know if you use this term, a hothead, someone that, you know, could get angry easily. And uh, which is why mom kept me behind her because I was thinking, well, mama, if you would just move a little more to the right, I'm going to fix her face. I mean, I felt like I was just going to punch her out. And, and, but mom, knowing this, wisely kept me behind her. But those kind of things made a mark on my life. Those kind of um, things with the church and, and uh, uh, you know, it was just very, very hard being a pastor's kid. One other story, I don't want to tell too many stories because I've already, you know, forgiven this. But one other thing that happened was... Um, I was dating this boy, he happened to be Catholic, of course we were Baptists, and Baptists and Catholics don't get together in those days, and uh, so uh, my daddy came to me one day and he said, um, I don't know what to do because the Women's Missionary Union just had a meeting and they voted that you should break up with your boyfriend because he's Catholic. And, you know, I mean, my daddy didn't say you have to break up with him, but she let, he let me know about this meeting. Now, when you think about popping some boundaries, why would someone do that? Why would someone have a church meeting, tell a young person they needed to break up with their boyfriend? They had evidently see us, seen us walking down the street holding hands, some of the leaders, and they felt that was quite sinful because he was a Catholic. Well, we know that, that there's a lot of prejudice in the world. And um, I didn't end up marrying him. I ended up marrying my handsome husband I have today. But the point is, those things mounted up inside of me. And the Lord showed me I had to, I had to start forgiving. I just had to forgive. And so, you know, I, uh, I ended up just being an emotional mess because of that. And my emotions ruled and reigned me reigned in me. And God said to me, Sidney, you have to live in the will of God, not in your emotions. Like I'd get up in the morning and I'd say to my emotions, how do you feel today? And that's how I'd feel. No, no. I learned I had to get up in the morning and say, Cindy, this is what the word of God says about your day. This is what the word of God says about your emotions. The word of God says that there is a hope for me, that God has a plan for me. That God has a future for me. Therefore, I'm not going to stay in this position I am now. My family's not going to always be poor. 
I'm not going to always be fighting, you know, uh, with, with the Women's Missionary Union, you know, who've hurt my daddy. And so, you know, I began to tell my emotions that emotions you're going to have to change. And so, as I was in the midst of all this, the Lord said to me, get up and go back to university. Well, I'm a classical pianist, maybe some of you are a pianist too. And you know how hard it is to play the piano when your hands shake. Well, part of what had happened to me during this time was my hands began to shake very badly. I could not like hold my hands still. So I couldn't write because, you know, my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't write with a pen. And I certainly could not play the piano. I could not put my finger on a, piano, a single individual key because my hands would shake so badly. But I learned I'm living in the will of God. I'm living in the blessing of God. So when I first went back to university, I was a junior, so I had to prepare for my junior level piano recital, meaning I had to memorize 25 pages of music in every, you know, period, the Baroque, the classical, romantic, you know, composers, and I had to memorize them all. And I had a problem. I couldn't play one note without my hand shaking. So I would go to the practice rooms and I would take my other hand and I would hold my hand and make it touch one note. And after a while, I could play a chord. I could play more notes. And at the end, in a number of months, say, I, you know, probably about eight months, I had memorized 25 pages of different periods of, com of composers and I played it flawlessly. And I got an A on my performance. It was a miracle. Why? Because I could, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to believe a lie what Satan was saying about my life. Another thing that happened at that time was I wanted to be a missionary. But the Southern Baptist had a ruling at that time that if you had any emotional problems, you could not go on the mission field. Well, I obviously had emotional problems. I was very fearful. I was scared. I was scared to speak in public. I was scared to do things in public. But you see, that was against the will of God for my life. God had a plan for me. God had a plan for me to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. I preached to more than 100 nations. God had a plan for me to speak to stadiums full of people. But yet I was in such bondage. I was in such fear. I was such an emotional mess. I was so shipwrecked in my life that it was going against my destiny. Don't you think Satan knew that? Don't you think Satan is fighting your destiny? You have to make a decision, beautiful women, somehow to get free. I remember another time in my life when my daddy died suddenly. Daddy was 49. He was a church planter. And uh, he had wanted to go on the home mission board. He was a church planter uh, with, with the home mission board, but he wanted to, to be recognized as a missionary. And so he went and he asked um, our denomination if, if they would support him in that. Well, and, and they said, well, and you need a job. You need a job to do. And so what they did was um, they offered him to be a janitor. Now, my father was you know, extremely educated man, you know, very educated, uh, a master's work, you know, um, uh, from seminary, but he needed to feed his family. So he went and cleaned the, the, the uh, building of the Baptist administration. Well, after about six months, he went back and he said, um, you know, what happened to my appointment? And they said, oh, we turned you down many months before. Well, Daddy was such a good janitor, they just didn't want to tell him, you know, because he was doing a really good job that he wasn't appointed. Well, you know, that broke my heart. That broke my heart, and my daddy died of a broken heart. Not that long after that, he, about a year or so after that, he dropped dead of a massive heart attack. Well, that affected me. It affected me. And one day the Lord said to me, Cindy, you have got to forgive those who you feel caused the death of your dad. You've got to really forgive him. And so I did. I began to pray, and I began to forgive. And the Bible spoke to me out of the book of James. Confess your faults one to another, that you may be healed. James 5, 16. And I began to confess, saying, Lord, I forgive these people. I, and the Lord began to just show me pictures of things that had happened in my life. Now, as I'm saying this to you, maybe pictures are 
are coming up in, in your mind of things that have happened to you. Sometimes we can stuff them so deep in our soul that we're not aware that we need to forgive. We, you know, sometimes we just pass it off quickly. And uh, so let me, let me talk about this and about being shipwrecked, and let me talk how to get out of it. Number one, bad things happen, and then we blame God. John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, says the Lord, to give life and more abundant life. So it wasn't God that hurt you. We know it was Satan. So don't let Satan win. Understand that the thief is trying to rob your destiny. And so one day, you know, going back to the story of my daddy dropping dad and the Baptist, I was preaching in the same city where, where they broke daddy's heart. And it was very interesting. And the Lord said to me, you can't preach today. And I said, what? Why can't I preach? And he said, you have sin in your heart. And I thought, what? What sin do I have in my heart? And he said, you hate this city. And you hate that denomination for what they did to your daddy. He said, now I want you to get up and kneel down and confess your sin in front of the church. This was a church of 3,000 people, packed crowd. So the Lord said, you can't even preach till you deal with this. So I will never forget, I knelt down. The elders of the church came around me. I would confessed my sin out loud. And I was so surprised. They said, I confess I hate this city. It was the city of Phoenix, Arizona. I confess I hate this city because they broke my daddy's heart. And, and if they had taken the gun out, I remember saying this out of my mouth, shockingly, and shot him, they couldn't have killed him more. Wow. I just began to weep. But you know what? God healed my soul that day. Something changed. You know, God can heal your soul. Bad things do happen to us sometimes. But don't live in that bad place. God wants to get you out of the bad, that bad place. Number two, we feel so condemned when we get in that place that we feel we'll never be the same. Maybe we've actually sinned. You know, maybe there's something we've done and we just sinned against God. Maybe you lost your virginity. Or maybe, you know, there was some bad mistake you made, something horrible you did. But I want to say to you, you cannot live there. It's your choice today. Life is about choices. It's your choice to believe the word of God. Jesus came to forgive sinners. He came to forgive people who fail. Remember, the apostle Paul was Saul before and caused the death of many Christians. How do you think Saul lived with himself from day to day? Saul could live with himself from day to day, who had been the chief of sinners, because he knew the redeeming Christ. He knew the power of God to forgive. There's nothing God cannot forgive. Yes, there's consequences sometimes to our, our wrong actions, our sin. But God forgives you. He forgives you today. He doesn't want you to stay in that awful place. And so, point three, we do not monitor our spiritual walk enough to understand what we're going to and going backwards. Sometimes... When, when we are shipwrecked, we don't realize it happened. I mean, like when those things happened to me or happened against my dad, I didn't think, oh, I hate you. I didn't think, I don't forgive you. I will never forgive you. That never went through my mind. But the impact was the same. The impact was the same. I did have unforgiveness. I did hate that city. I did hate those people. And so I was shipwrecked in my emotions. And finally, all of those emotions caught up with me when I was a junior, going to be a junior in college. So much that I broke down. So much I left university, even though I had the year paid for. But I began to understand that for forgiveness. I began to understand that I needed to forgive all those church people that had hurt my daddy and hurt my family. I need to forgive them for not paying us enough that we had enough food to eat. I, I, you know, today, even today, if I go to, I can go to a restaurant and pretty much buy whatever I want to eat. 
You know, that's still a delight to me, even though that was, you know, what, 50 years ago now, something like that. You know, but God has healed me. I didn't stay in that place of fear. I didn't stay in that place where I was emotionally bound. So you need to be aware what is happening to you spiritually. You need to be aware what's happening to you emotionally. I think maybe self-awareness. The Bible says we need to love ourselves as we love others. And do we really love ourselves? Well, sometimes we don't. Sometimes people enter a place where you don't love yourself so much that you literally want to die. Even if you don't kill yourself or you're just so miserable or your emotions are down and you're so anxious. No, God wants to give you hope today. I was the most hopeless. I would have killed myself. I wish I would die, but I didn't want to hurt my family. But you know what? Satan wanted to rob me of my destiny, just like he wants to rob you. Satan wants to take the life out of you. And you know, yes, bad things do happen to good people. Satan is real. He's a roaring lion, the Bible says. He runs around wanting to devour and kill. But Jesus is the lion of Judah. And he roars against your enemies. And he stands against your enemies. You are not meant to live tomorrow the way you live today. And we can always do better. Recently, the Lord showed me something. I was shocked. There was something so deep in my soul, so buried deep in there that it happened to me. And actually, he took me back to a place where Mike and I had lived. It just, you know, I, I went there to speak. And the night before, I was just making sure I was right with God. I always, you know, tried to, to keep short accounts with God. And the Lord showed me something that happened in that city. Um, it was actually, uh, there was a, a minister's retreat. And um, the invitation for the minister's retreat, you know, that came to my husband, Mike, had a little asterisk, asterisk at the bottom. It said, women are not invited. Well, that just went like a dart in my soul. Now, I didn't like it, but I didn't realize that really affected me. And then there were other meetings, you know, where people would take, I remember one pastor's wife taking me out to lunch, telling me, you don't understand the bride of Christ because you preach. Women can't do that. Women can't teach men. And, uh, you know, it was painful. I remember saying, well, what about all the missionaries? We're just going to call all the missionaries home from the mission field. But you know what? That impacted me. I didn't think it did impact me because I knew the truth. I didn't think it hurt me emotionally, but it did. So I just went deep into forgiveness. That night before I was to preach, I said, Lord, I do choose to forgive. I just, I thank you, Lord, Lord, that you are giving me grace and strength. And you know what? By the next day, when I got up to speak, it was gone. The Lord had healed me. I want you to be healed too. What I would like you to do is just take a moment and just take account of your life. Maybe you want to do this, you know, in the seminar. Maybe you will just want to pause a moment and pray for one another. Maybe you want to confess your sins. Maybe there's something that happened to you. The Holy Spirit is just pulling up. You know, there are depths of forgiveness. When we ask forgiveness, we get right before God. In other words, we're not eternally held in account for the sin of unforgiveness against a person. But sometimes our soul needs to get healed too. Our, our mind and our emotions need to get healed. And maybe the Lord is just bringing some things to your heart that, that you need to mourn. You know, when you pray with someone else and they've gone through a hard time, the Bible has a very important principle. It says, Mourn with those who mourn. Sometimes someone needs to just tell us how much they hurt. Not, they don't, they don't need our mouth, they need our shoulder. Sometimes they just need to say how they feel without us criticizing them, without us interjecting ourselves into it. Sometimes people don't share their heart because they don't want to 
be criticized by a religious spirit. Can we be a safe place? Can we be a safe place, a shoulder and not a mouth for other people to come to? Ones that will just, they can trust us with their deep secrets. They can trust us. God wants you to get out of this shipwreck state. God wants you to be beautiful, spirit, soul, and body, mind, will, and emotion. God wants to take you from this place of hurt. Maybe you're depressed like I was. I was very depressed. And, you know, um, I just had gotten caught in a time of uncertainty where I couldn't make up my mind about some important decisions, and so I just broke down. But God doesn't want that for you. God wants you to know you're loved. I want you to get more beautiful every year. I want people to look at you and say, what is it about you? There's just some quality about you that is so beautiful. Now let me pray with you. Father God, I thank you for the women that are watching, that are attending this conference today. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that you are bringing up those things in their soul that are deep, that are hurting. Lord, you want to heal today. You only reveal to heal. And Father, I thank you for this. I thank you, Lord, that right now you're shining your light on those places in all of our hearts, mine too, Lord, where we thought, you know, we had dealt with the situation, but we really, really haven't. Let me tell you one more story, and uh, then I'll prophesy a little bit to you. Um, years ago, there was a woman who came, a pioneer woman preacher, came and preached at our church. This had to be, oh, more than 30 years ago. And uh, I, had, I had recommended her to come. It was a church I attended. I wasn't the pastor. And when I came back from my trip, she'd already preached. Things were different. People weren't treating me the same. They were kind of being distant. And finally, a friend of mine came and opened up and said, well, let, it, let me tell you what she said about you. And this woman had criticized me. This woman had, um, uh, you know, just uh, disparaged me to the church and the leadership of the church. A woman I thought was my friend, an older woman I looked up to, and it hurt me so badly. And I knew I needed to be healed. And I prayed. I asked God to forgive. And I, I just couldn't seem to forgive her. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. And I just cried out to the Lord one day, Lord, just show me what to do. And I had a dream. And in this dream, and I'll tell you, as I tell you that what I did in this dream, it's very unlike me. But I, I saw this woman. And I took her hand and I flipped her up over and she fell on the floor and I crawled right up beside her and I started saying, and you did this and you did this and you did this and how could you do that? I just, all my unforgiveness just spilled out and I awakened and I was completely healed. I mean, it was just gone. And after that, I wrote a letter to her and I just shared with her my heart of the situation and she called and was very apologetic and our relationship got healed. Listen, relationships are worth fighting for. Maybe you have a broken relationship, but I want to tell you that relationship is worth fighting for. Don't let Satan steal from you. God wants to restore. So the Lord is showing me there's someone that you have a family, excuse me, a family breakup. There's, you have an extended family and you're very broken in your family. Uh, people aren't talking to each other. It's just a, a terrible time. God is going to heal and restore. The Lord is going to show you what to do about it to bring restoration. I see someone else that you're having a lot of female problems. And uh, the Lord is going to show you the root of why you're having some of these problems. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for uncovering the root in Jesus' name. I remember many years ago I had a big, uh, like a grapefruit-sized tumor in my body behind my, my uh, ovaries not attached, but behind, and the doctors wanted to operate. And I just well, said, well, just give me 10 days to pray. And I began to pray during those 10 days, and I got a phone call from someone I hardly knew. And they said, Cindy, we feel like this is a root of rejection in you. 
and it comes from your family. And at first I almost rejected that because we're a very close family, great parents. I didn't have an orphan spirit at all. My daddy believed in me 100%. My mom believed in me. But then the Lord showed me something. The Lord showed me that when I was born, my daddy had left the hospital to go fix something on the church that he was planting, the first vacation Bible school, and the, the inspector was meeting him on the site. So here I was being born, but my mother said, go, Albert, I'll be okay. And he did. He left. And the Lord, I never knew that affected me. It was just a family story. But the Lord showed me that my struggle with the church, which I had for many years after that, you heard some of the stories, my struggle with the church started then because my birth wasn't important enough for my daddy to stay. The church was more important. And I forgave. I forgave that church. I forgave my daddy. He'd been gone many years by that point. And I just pulled out that root of rejection. I said, Lord, I just want that gone for me. I'm not going to despise the church. I just want that gone for me. And I tell you what, it left me. And when I went back to the doctor, that tumor was completely gone, disappeared. In fact, the doctor said, usually they're scarring when you've had a tumor that size in your body. No scarring. God completely healed me. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, right now for healing your women, beautiful women. I thank you, Lord, that you're giving them hope. We are women of hope. We are women that bring hope to others. Amen. Well, thank you, beautiful women. Thank you, Pastor Callie and uh, the ministry. And I just pray God bless you abundantly for the rest of the meetings. We hope that you've been blessed by this video and we invite you to partner with Worldwide Glory Network Alliance to defray the costs of the conference and set up 50 prayer houses in 2022 by sowing into the ministry. If you are outside Singapore, visit bit.ly forward slash WGNA donate to donate via PayPal, credit card, WISE.com or the WISE app. For WISE, send your donation in Singapore dollars. Select bank transfer under the payment method. Select setting to business or charity and enter admin at wgnalliance.com in their mail field. Then choose either bank account or pay now. For bank account, enter the name of the organization as Worldwide Glory Network Alliance Limited and choose Standard Chartered Bank Singapore Limited and enter the bank account number on the screen. Alternatively, you can also click on the pay now option, enter the organization name and UEN number on the screen and your email in the notes field. You may also do a bank transfer or check by taking down the bank details and instructions on the screen. Thank you so much for your generous contribution and we believe that God will multiply much more back to you. We hope you enjoy the rest of this message.